right, welcome everybody. So, um, uh, some of you may have uh, been to my keynote this morning, which was more of a uh, philosophical talk about what can we all do to be better programmers. This is a much more traditional technical talk uh, about where is Java going in the next few years. Um, I like doing these kinds of talks because I get to talk about what I've actually been working on, which is kind of fun. Um, you'll notice that my, my talk's actually already a little out of date, right? This is the early 2019 edition, and we're already in mid-2019, and uh, maybe a few of these things that are in my slides will actually be out of date. You can, I'll call them out if, uh, if they are. So this is how you know I work at Oracle. Okay, so let's talk about evolution. Um, you know, Java is, uh, we like to think of it as middle-aged, some people say old. Uh, Java is, uh, I think, was just turned 24 uh, a few weeks ago. And in these last, you know, uh, t two decades since Java's been around, Java has been declared to be dead quite a few times. Um, and yet, it's still probably the world's most popular programming platform, and we want that to continue to be true for the next 20 years as well, and we have a, a secret plan for doing so, and our secret, secret plan is stay relevant. Stay relevant to the problems people want to solve, the hardware people want to run on, and keep our promises that we've made to users. Um, and it's actually a pretty simple formula, and it's been working pretty well for us. When I talk about keeping our promises, what I mean is uh, don't devalue the code that people have written by changing things out from under them. If you wrote code last year or five years ago or 20 years ago in Java, it should still work. It should still compile, and if you have old class files, they should still run on a modern JVM with small exceptions. Um, and you know, by keeping these promises, uh, this is how we maintain the trust that people have built up. You know, people have come to trust Java, and there's a reason for that. It's because we haven't broken our promises. Uh, the flip side of, in, of, of uh, focusing so much on compatibility is things take longer. They cost more. Uh, there are, we have options that we can't pursue because they would be incompatible, even if they might have been the right idea if we were starting from, uh, from a clean sheet of paper. Um, you know, but we care a lot about uh, the investment people have made in the code they've written in Java and what they've learned about the, the Java language, and we don't want to invalidate that. So as an example of uh, the sort of thing that we do that makes everything take longer and cost more, um, think about generics. When we did generics in Java 5, uh, we, we didn't have a flag day where you know, the whistle blew and everybody stopped, um, you know, stopped coding and everyone recompiled their code all at once, right? That would have gone over really well. Uh, the, you know, what we did was we uh, focused on ensuring that there was migration compatibility where a class could be migrated to generics now, later, or never, and its clients could be independently migrated to use generics now, later, or never, right? So um, th this, this avoided the situation where you had libraries that were generic and you couldn't call them from non-generic code or, or vice versa. Um, and probably a good 60, 70% of the effort that went into doing generics was about migration compatibility. Uh, because we wanted people to be able to continue to use the code that they had and get the benefits of generics at their own pace. Um, and you know, we did a similar thing when we did lambdas. Uh, you know, we could have added function types to the language. Some people thought that that was the right thing to do. We instead chose to keep using idioms like runnable and callable that people were already familiar with so that existing libraries that were written even before they knew lambdas were coming to Java could work with lambdas on day one. So, uh, you know, the, um, having a large user base and a large base of, of existing code is a constraint, um, you know, and we take that into account as we uh, evolve the platform because we don't want people to feel like we've invalidated their code. Um, so when we think about what language features should we add to Java, there's certainly no shortage of suggestions that people make. Uh, we, we think about them very carefully because language features are forever. And each feature has the potential to interact with every other feature in the language, hopefully in good ways, but sometimes in not good ways, and also can interact with features that we haven't done yet and might not be able to do. If we do one thing, we can't do something else that conflicts with it. Um, and so we take a very cautious approach where if we don't know what the right thing to do is, the right thing is to do nothing and think about it 
until we have a better answer. And a really good example of this was what we did with the generics. Uh, generics didn't come to Java until 2004. Uh, it's not that we didn't know about parametric polymorphism in 1992, or that we didn't think it was important, or that we thought it was a great idea that you had to cast uh, something when you took it out of a collection. It's that we didn't know how to do it right. And if we had been forced to do parametric polymorphism in 1995, we would have ended up with something probably closer to C++ templates. Who thinks that would have been a good future, right? So um, there's, a, there's yeah, yeah, a few, few difficult people in the audience. But uh, you know, I, I think we're glad that we waited, you know, waited 10 years and got it right. Um, and the same thing is true with lambdas. I don't know if, how many people remember the, the bitter debates in the community about how to do lambdas in Java in 2005, 2006. And that was a good debate to have, but I wouldn't want to be using any of those proposals. I'm glad we took a few more years and thought about it and got it right. And you know, all of this is in aid of not having more fun coding, but about making it easier to build and maintain reliable programs. Because uh, being able to maintain programs means that you will be able to continue to get value from the code you wrote five years ago, 10 years ago. If code is unreadable, unmaintainable, then the next time you need to change it, that's gonna be the code that you're gonna advocate to throw away. And that means you're uh, throwing away value that you've invested you know, time and effort in, uh, in building. Okay, so I keep using the word evolve um, because I think that's really what's going on here. Uh, programming languages exist in an ecosystem. And when that ecosystem changes, you either need to evolve or you're gonna die. And you know, I think it should be obvious that there will never be a perfect programming language because even if there was, well, the sorts of problems that we solve with, with computers is gonna change over time, and so what might have been perfect you know, uh, for the world five years ago is not gonna be perfect for the world today. Um, and so things need to evolve. And you know, the, the evolutionary metaphor, I think, is pretty useful. That, you know, so you can think of, in this ecosystem, you can think of programming languages as being like the predators, and you can think of the problems that we solve with computers as being the food supply, and there's an environment, you know, uh, the current state of hardware and software and databases and all, all of those other things that, that, that condition the way we program. And, you know, it's very tempting to talk about uh, languages or tools or paradigms as being good or bad. Uh, and I much prefer to talk about them as being evolutionarily fit or not for the environment they happen to find themselves in. And, like, you know, those things are going to change over time. So something that was a perfect fit uh, for one point in history is not necessarily a good fit for another point in history. I mean, COBOL was a viciously fit predator for the programming problems of the 1960s, but it's not so interesting today because the world has moved on, the environment has changed, the problems have changed. So um, one of the other things that changes is developer expectations. Uh, and this is also part of the ecosystem. Uh, in, in Java 1.0, we didn't have generics, we didn't have lambdas, and you know, a lot of us grew to like Java even without those things. But now if you look back at some of the code you, know, you wrote 20 years ago, the reaction is probably gonna be, yuck, how did we live with that, right? So the things that we thought were super cool 20 years ago don't look as cool today because the world's moved on and we've moved on and our expectations have moved on. So in order to stay relevant, we have to evolve. So, you know, we're clearly not done evolving Java. Um, it, you know, and uh, hopefully we'll never be done. Hopefully we'll get to continue to, to keep evolving it. But we should also be mindful that it's possible for languages to get what I call full. Um, and, you know, the poster child for this, I think, is probably Perl. Uh, if you um, shovel features into a language haphazardly, you're gonna get to a point where you can't make anything new fit because every, uh, every niche is taken. So we have to pick and choose fairly carefully. So, all right, so what's happened with Java in the last couple of years? It's been a pretty vibrant last few years. Uh, about almost two years ago at this point, we switched to a new release cadence. Uh, we had been going on a two, three, four year feature box release cadence, and we've switched to a six month time boxed release cadence. Uh, under, and we've actually delivered several releases under this plan, uh, 10, 11, and 12, uh, and soon 13 going to feature freeze in a couple of weeks. Um, so previously, uh, we had these feature-driven releases, they were big, and big surprise, when you're doing a big feature, it's hard to plan how long it's gonna take. Who knew, right? Uh, and 
Uh, so we were optimistic. We thought, okay, we can do this in two years, and really, it's, reality is closer to three or four because, you know, engineers are optimists. And from the uh, community perspective, the perception was, gee, Java was really slow. And there were some things that we didn't even think were worth doing if we couldn't, you know, if we weren't going to ship them for three or four years. A lot of the smaller features tended to get stuck behind the bigger features. And as a result, I think we over-rotated towards uh, some, some bigger features. And so moving to the more rapid cadence, I think, has changed a lot of things. There's obvious benefits. You know, it's more agile and lower um, release overhead. Uh, but, you know, it, I, I, the... the um, the advan you know, the advantages are deeper than that. It's been a, a really big, you know, really positive change for us. Uh, that, you know, when the next train is coming in six months, it becomes okay to miss the train. And that means you don't have to have an extensive release management process to make sure nothing misses the train. And that means you can spend more of your time on engineering, which I like a lot. Um, so we released Java 9 in September 2017. This had been a big release, uh, three and a half years in the making, over 90 um, JDK enhancement proposals. That's sort of the, the feature unit that we use in OpenJDK, or we call them JEPs. Um, it was a big release. It was disruptive. Um, and uh, we released Java 10 six months later. It didn't have 90 JEPs in it because we hadn't been working on it for three and a half years. We'd only been working on it for, for six months. Uh, overall, the pace of innovation is about the same as it was, but the pace of innovation delivery is much faster. And similarly, every six months, like clockwork, we've uh, you know released another version. Um, and you know, one of the really cool things about it is I remember like what it was like when you got into the months leading up to a big release, like eight or nine. It was hell. Uh, and everybody was working like crazy to get everything, you know, on board. And that's, of course, not your most, uh, when you do your best work, when, you know, when, when everyone's working overtime and pushing themselves hard. And, you know, since we've switched to this new cadence, um, the release weeks are no stress at all. Because everything that's going to get on the train is already on the train. So it's been, it's been a huge change for us uh, and, and a very beneficial one. So, okay, so let me, um, let me talk about some of the features that we've delivered in these last few versions. Um, so uh, one of them here, this is uh, something we actually shipped three versions ago, but a lot of people, you know, are still stuck on. How many people here are still on Java 8? How many people got to Java 9, 10, 11? All right, so, so some, but a lot of people are still on, on Java 8. So uh, the things that we added in 10, which from my perspective are old hat, are still new to a lot of people. Um, this is a pretty small feature. Um, it's the kind of feature that we probably never would have done um, if we had these long-term multi-year releases. Uh, but it's something that people asked for. It was probably one of the most commonly requested features, which is... Let me use type inference to uh, infer the type of a local variable. So, uh, you know, the way you declare a variable in Java, everybody knows this, the type, the name, and then possibly an initializer. And of these three things, the type, the name, and the initializer, actually the most important thing is the name. Unfortunately, we put the type first. That's a historical accident. But a lot of the time, the type is, well, kind of obvious from the context. And it would be nice to be able to leave it out. Um, and so you can do that and say, all right, let the compiler infer the type for me from the type of whatever's on the right-hand side of the equal sign. This isn't dynamic typing. We're not turning Java into JavaScript. This is just plain old static typing with type inference, which Java has been doing for 15 years. Um, and we've just added one more context in which uh, you can do type inference. And, you know, people have various opinions on this. Some people say, well, gee, what took you so long? Everybody else already has this feature, and that's true. And then some people say, you're breaking Java. You're going to encourage bad programmers to write bad code. It's like, well, I don't, I don't think bad programmers need a lot of encouragement to write bad code. <laughs> so that doesn't worry me so much. Um, but what I do like about this is it brings your eyes towards the most important part of the line, which is the name. Because, of course, we all use clear descriptive names all the time, right? So if you're doing that, then the type might not add a lot of value, and you can leave it out if it, uh, if it doesn't. Um, this is an option. It's not a requirement. We're not making manifest typing illegal. We're just saying you now have the choice to use manifest typing or type inference, and we leave it to the responsibility of programmers to make good choices. Uh, and if you've picked good variable names, then um, then you know you shouldn't have any any problem. Uh, you know it, it shouldn't make your code any less readable. If you pick bad, bad variable names, then it will make your code less readable. So don't do that. 
Um, so, okay, has some restrictions. What are the restrictions? This is only for local variables. Uh, they're not for fields or method return types. Um, which is a reasonable restriction because uh, this is about simplifying implementation, but fields and methods are part of APIs and those should be explicit. Those are contracts between classes and there shouldn't be any uh, fuzziness about them. A lot of people, uh, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, a lot of people say, oh, this is just syntactic sugar. It's actually not just syntactic sugar. It goes a lot deeper. Uh, and in fact, um, some people might be surprised that it exposes some darker corners of the Java type system that you might not have thought about. Uh, Java has um, several categories of what are called non-denotable types, which is types that you can have variables, uh, have expressions that have that type, but you can't actually write it down. Uh, and these include things like intersection types and capture types. Um, and so uh, if I said var c equal this dot get class, you might think the type of c is class of question, but it's actually a capture type. It's class of capture of question extends this class. Uh, you, you only used to ever see those types in error messages before, um, and now they, they, they bubble up um, a little bit more to the surface. Um, these types have been part of the type system all along, uh, it, but you know they may have remained hidden from you. Uh, a, a, a more fun one is this one. If I say um, I say list of one comma two comma the string three, you might expect that to be list of question, but it actually turns out to be uh, the intersection of uh, uh, it turns out to be the least upper bound of all of those of, of, of integer and, and string, which turns out to be question extends serializable and comparable of something bigger that doesn't fit on my slide. Um, so, uh, you know, if you choose to use this feature, you might find yourself exposed to some corners of the type system that you didn't know were there. Think of it as an opportunity to learn more about how the language works. Um, now, from a, a community perspective, like I said, this was one of the most commonly requested features, but as soon as we said we were doing it, there was also some vocal pushback of, oh, this is just fashion, oh, this is a trivial feature, oh, you're just giving into what bad developers want. Um, those voices seem to have died down, um, you know, now that we've actually shipped this and people realize the world didn't end, just as it didn't end when Scala did this or C-sharp did this or Kotlin did this. Um, but it does take people some time uh, to get used to something new and, uh, and to understand how best to use it. And the first few times you try it, you'll probably get it wrong because that's how it works when you're learning to use a new tool. Um, but we have like put together some style guide um, and, uh, and a fact that should help people understand how to use it right. And, you know, this has been a pretty successful part of the process, we expect we'll continue to um, publish similar documents, uh, you know, going forward. All right, so that's sort of in the past. What's coming up in the future? Um, so we'll talk about the, um, the, the near future first and, uh, and, and, and a quick word about process. Um, as we've uh, made the cadence faster and shrunk down the schedule, what we realize is that we need to build a little bit of time back in to get feedback and to make sure we haven't made a mistake. Um, once a feature becomes a permanent part of the Java platform, we don't want to change it. Um, and so we don't want to be too hasty about putting a feature in that hasn't been used in anger. And so what we've done is we've introduced uh, a mechanism which we call preview features uh, in, into the lifecycle where new language features will go through a round or two of being preview features. And what that means is they're not experimental or beta or anything like that. They're, they're fully formed, fully specified, fully tested, but they're being put out there for people to try and give us feedback, and we hope we'll get feedback. Uh, and we'll hope, we hope we'll get feedback in time to actually make changes if it turns out we've made a mistake. Um, and so you probably don't want to be using them in production, but you know that's that's up to you. Um, and in order to use preview features, you actually have to turn them on explicitly, just so that you won't accidentally be relying on, say, some jar in Maven Central that's using preview features, and you don't realize that uh, um, you know that they're they're doing so. So there's an opt-in on the compiler and and the launcher. Um, and uh, most of the IDEs have already uh, already have support for it. So like IntelliJ, when you bring up the language level picker, it'll say 12 or 12 with preview, and that will determine you know what language level support they give you. So uh, that's a bit of mechanism. So uh, we've actually shipped one preview feature uh, in Java 12, which are some enhancements to the switch statement. 
Um, and if you think about um, think about this, the switch statement, it, I, I think the switch statement was sort of one of the weak points of the original Java language design. And one of the reasons it was weak is I think we lean too heavily on what does switch mean in C. Um, and so it has a number of deficiencies that people find irritating like um, the default is to fall through rather than to not fall through. That's kind of a, uh, was probably a, a, the wrong default. Um, and switch is a statement, but most people use it like it were an expression in a kind of roundabout way. So, you know, where in each switch arm you'll assign to some common variable and then you'll use that variable after the switch is finished. Um, and so this sort of mismatch between how people want to use switch and how it works is error prone and leads to um, you know uh, uh, b both both more risky code and more verbose co verbose code. So uh, we started looking at switch when we were looking at a bigger feature called pattern matching, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but then we realized that well, these enhancements enhancements to switch they are fully general. Uh, whether or not we have pattern matching, we sort of like uh, pulled them out of uh, pattern matching and delivered them earlier. Um, and uh, they, like I said, they were shipped as a preview feature in 12. They will probably re-preview in 13 before being made permanent. And as an example of the kind of um, uh, you know, uh, redundancy that gives bugs a uh, place to hide, um, here's a typical switch statement. We're using it basically like an expression. We have a variable called num letters. We're going to assign to num letters in every arm of the switch, and then we're going to use it afterwards. And all right, so where's the repetition? Well, everywhere, right? So I'm assigning, um, you know, in all of the uh, all of the arms. Um, I have to say break every time. That's kind of irritating. And then, you know, to add insult to injury, I have to write a default clause. Uh, that uh, that throws a worthless exception, uh, which we hope will never happen. Um, so wh whoever was writing this code, they wanted to write an expression, but they couldn't. The language wouldn't let them, right? So, uh, but morally, we would kind of like for switch to be an expression. Um, and this is what it looks like as an expression, where, um, and, 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 and we've actually, there's actually sort of two separate enhancements to switch here, and this example uses both of them. One of them is it can be a statement or an expression, and the other is you have a streamlined form for the case labels where if you only have one consequence on the right-hand side, you can use an arrow instead of a colon, and you don't have to say break because the compiler knows to expect only one thing on the right side. So this code is a lot more compact, uh, and uh, it's also more reliable because the compiler will verify that the expression is total, that you've covered all the cases. Um, and in fact, it knows because you're switching over an enum and you've named all the cases, it doesn't even force you to say, have a default clause which, which throws. It's going to insert one for you because someone could add more values to the enum later. Uh, but you know, th this is um, there's no there's no need for you to actually write that. It's actually better if you don't, because now if someone does add a, a, a day to this enum, the next time you go to recompile this, you'll get a compilation error, and it'll say this switch isn't complete, and that will be a reminder that you uh, you want to deal with that, or maybe you don't want to deal with it, but you can do it deliberately. So, like I said, this is two separate um, and orthogonal enhancements. You could use either or both uh, together. One is switch as an expression versus a statement. Um, and the other is the streamlined case labels, where you say case label, arrow, and then a consequence, which is either a single expression for a switch expression or a single statement for a, a statement switch. Um, and uh, with these streamlined labels, there's no fall through allowed. Um, and so not only don't you have to say break, you can't say break. Um, so this is you know, kind of what people, I think, wanted Switch to be years ago. Uh, but you know, it, it's, um, and, and we were somewhat constrained by the way Switch works now, but uh, it is, it is pretty, pretty pleasant to use. Um, and better checking for exhaustiveness if you're switching over something like an enum or in the future like a SQL type uh, where the compiler knows how to reason about exhaustiveness. So that's pretty cool. That's, like I said, a preview feature in 12, probably will still be a preview feature in 13. Okay, so what's coming up? Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, in fact, way more coming up than I could possibly cover in a one hour talk. So I'm only gonna talk about a few of the things that are going on. Um, there are uh, qu 
quite a few separate projects going on in OpenJDK. I'm going to talk about two of them, Project Amber, Project Valhalla. I'm not going to talk about Panama or Loom uh, in this talk. Um, Project Amber is uh, what we call right-sizing language ceremony. Uh, it's, uh, it's aimed at filing down the rough edges that Java programmers complain about all the time, like uh, you know, having to manifestly type, uh, type a local variable instead of being able to save R. And there's a couple of uh, features we're working on in the context of Amber. Uh, both switch expressions and var came out of Amber. Um, and, uh, and, there, and there's a couple more features coming. So uh, an example, uh, one of the, I think the, probably the biggest thing that we're working on in Amber is pattern matching. And this is a feature that uh, you might have seen from other languages. It's historically been associated with functional languages, but there's nothing strictly functional about it. It just happens to have been more popular in functional languages. But pattern matching um, is about taking three things that we do together all the time and uh, rather than making them three things, making them one thing. So, uh, and, and these three things are test, conditional extract, and bind. So in an example like this where we say, is object an instance of integer? So that's a test. Then what's the next thing we do with that? We cast it, right? That's a conditional extraction. We only do the casting if the test succeeded, and then we you know, extract its, its, its value as the, uh, the desired type, and then we bind that to a local variable. And we do these things together all the time. Um, and it's kind of irritating that you do the instance of, then the next thing you have to do is a cast. Like, what else were you going to do, right? In fact, the only thing you can, the only other thing you can do than cast it to the right type is cast it to the wrong type, right? And we've all done that. We've cut and pasted, right? And it's, just, it's almost like the language daring you to make a mistake, right? So pattern matching um, fuses these into a primitive uh, that includes the test, the conditional extraction, and the binding all in one. Um, and the way it looks, the way a pattern looks, is uh, here's the simplest kind of pattern. It's a type pattern, which has a type name and a variable name, which looks a little bit like a declaration, not an accident. And what we're saying is um, th the, uh, the, t the test associated with the type pattern is instance of. If the test succeeds, we're going to cast it to that, and we're going to bind it to the variable declared in value there, which will be in scope inside the body of the if. Um, and this is just one kind of pattern. It's the simplest kind of pattern. Um, but uh, even just something as simple as this will probably make 100% of the casts in the world go away because you'll be able to replace an instance of and a cast with, a, you know, turn, turn the instance of into a pattern match. Um, and, you know, like I said, that eliminates uh, a, a, a repetition, which is a place for bugs to hide. I don't care so much about typing the code, but I care about... Um, making code less error prone. Um, the, uh, the scoping for the binding variables and patterns is actually pretty subtle, but you might not notice it because it just always works. Uh, so for example, uh, if I say in this example, if O instance of this class and then I bind it to T, T is going to be in scope in any code whose control flow is dominated by the test. Uh, so it will be, I'll be able to use it in a short circuit and expression, and I could rewrite equals as instance of this class T, and this size equals that size, and this name equals that name. Um, and if you look at the kind of code that we, uh, the IDE generates for you for equals, it's this nasty hard to follow control flow. This is a lot more obvious, easier to follow, harder to make a mistake with. We can use patterns and switch also, um, and you know we, we all write uh, b because switch is so limited currently. We all tend to unroll things that we think of in our head as being switch into chains of if else. So here's a common example of an if else chain where you do a uh, an instance of and a cast, and then you use it, and then in the next arm you do exactly the same thing. And again, there's lots of repetition here. There's repetition between the test and the cast. There's uh, repeated tests. There's repeated assignments, and we can um, turn this into a switch whose uh, case labels are patterns, and we eliminate the cast and the instance of, and that it looks kind of nice. And the code is already starting to get more readable, right? It's, it's not lost in this sea of boilerplate like it was. So that's kind of nice. And in fact, you know, we can combine that with the feature I just talked about, which is a switch as an expression, and we end up with co some code that looks like this which is probably the code you actually had in your head when you sat down to write the horrible thing I had three slides ago, but you know you couldn't write it this way before, now, now you can. 
So, um, you know, pattern matching is actually like a pretty deep well. Uh, these are sort of trivial examples, uh, and I'll get into a few more complicated examples also. But let me digress for a minute and talk about declaring uh, classes that are data carriers. Um, a lot of the classes we write are very simple. They're simple carriers for data. This is actually one of the places where object-oriented programming kind of fails. In, the, in its zeal to make everything an object, we forget that some things don't really want to be objects. They just want to be data. And so to simulate data with objects is this big messy thing with constructors and accessors and equals and hash code and all this garbage. Um, and it's tedious and it's annoying, but the IDE generates it for you, so you don't actually have to write it, but you still have to read it. Um, and if you, you know, if you have this explicit code, it's an opportunity to get things wrong. Um, and you know, if, you, if you look at the, you know, the kind of classes that we write uh, you know, for, to wrap data with, you kind of get the point that we're sort of operating at the wrong level of abstraction. We're trying to treat these things as full-blown objects when really we'd like to be able to say, you know, this class is just a holder for its data. That's all it is. And like, I don't need it to be anything fancy. I'm willing to give up a bunch of things for that um, if I can get something good in return. So, um, you know, we write classes like this, but we don't really write this. We write this. Um, and, you know, we should be able to derive all of the garbage in small type from a simple statement that says a point is x and y, where x and y are ints. And if we're willing to say that, we're willing to make that semantic statement that you can derive the API and the implementation from a state description, we can write our point class in a much simpler way. So um, again, this is not rocket science. Uh, you know, other languages have similar features. Um, and these are real classes. You can have, you know, uh, you can have methods in there and, 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 and such. There's, there are some restrictions. But it, it's... Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you want to express classes that are just carriers for your data, if we can say this class is just data, then the compiler can do some work for us. It can give us an equals, a hash code, a two string, a constructor, accessors, et cetera, and actually a little bit more. Um, so it's easy to focus on the boilerplate reduction because we're all drowning in boilerplate. We hate boilerplate. But actually, there's something more important going on, which is the semantic commitment of this class is this data, full stop. Um, and it's a little bit like the trade we made with enums, right? So enums, you could, we didn't need to add enums to Java, but they're convenient. And, and the reason they're convenient is you're making this little trade with a compiler where you say, okay, I'm willing to give up something. I'm willing to give up control over instances. And in return, what I get is I don't have to declare uh, you know, two string and hash code and equals, and, and I don't have to, um, you know, I, I, I don't have to explicitly initialize all my instances. I just list the names out and the compiler does the rest, right? So that's a good trade if your class fits into the restrictions for enum. You know, uh, you, 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 you might choose to use it. Records are the same thing. Not every class fits into this mold, but if they do, uh, you get a lot of functionality for free because you made this semantic commitment of this class is just this data. So, um, those of you who have programmed in functional languages um, will recognize records as being one half of a bigger concept called algebraic data types, which are product types and some types. Records are product types. Uh, the other half, which is some types, is also useful. A some type is, sa is simply saying the type X is either Y or Z. And uh, earlier, when, when I talked about um, uh, expression switches, I talked about exhaustiveness. And I've talked about how the compiler knows that there are only seven uh, constants in the enum day of week. And so if you've included all seven of them, uh, it doesn't make you write the default clause. Sealed types uh, or some types are another form of exhaustiveness. If you say a shape is a circle or a rectangle, and I have a switch that covers circle and rectangle, the compiler can figure out, you've covered all the cases, you don't have to write a default clause. Um, and so by giving the compiler this information, it can reason about exhaustiveness and help us type check our programs better. So a sealed type is a very simple thing. It's uh, saying this type can only have these subtypes. That's the exhaustive list of subtypes, can't have any others. So for example, we could have a sealed type for shape and we could say that there are two kinds of shape, circle and rectangle. And what's a circle? Well, it's a record. Um, and what's the state of a circle? It's a center point and a radius. 
and we can have a record for rectangle, which has different state. What's the state of that? It's two points that are corners. And I know that a circle is defined by its center and radius, a rectangle is defined by its corners, and a shape is either a circle or a rectangle. All right, that's useful, that's compact, but let's, uh, let's look at how this plays back into pattern matching, because this is where it gets really cool. Records are a really good um, fit for pattern matching uh, because we've made a semantic statement of this class is just the data. And that means we should be able to go not only from state to, um, to an object, but we should also be able to go backwards from an object to its constituent state. Take a circle, give me its radius and its center. Um, and the compiler can generate that uh, code for free, and we call these deconstruction patterns. Uh, so we saw type patterns earlier. A deconstruction pattern is a fancier version of a type pattern where you say, um, so shape instance of circle, it's gonna do an instance of test of are you a circle, and if so, not only will it cast it to circle, but it will extract its center and its radius, um, not by matching fields or names or anything like that, the, um, but by looking at the declaration of the class where we say a circle is a center and a radius, and uh, it will type check that you've provided the right number of bindings and they're the right type and all of that. And you can use type inference there as well or explicit types. Um, and you know this isn't magic. They're, uh, deconstruction patterns are ordinary class members just like constructors. They're kind of like the opposite of constructors. Um, and records get them for free. So if we wanted to compute, say, the, um, the area of a shape, well, we switch over the shape and we pattern match on circle and extract the radius, and we say uh, the, 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 uh, the area is pi r squared. If we pattern match on rectangle, and it gives us two points, the, the area is delta y times delta x. And we've covered all the cases, so we don't need to say default, right? So um, you know, th this is not just boilerplate reduction. This is richer semantics, where we're, by saying a circle is a center and a radius, we can deconstruct it using a simple uh, t um, deconstruction pattern, and the um, and you know, and we can use those in instance of or switch or or what have you. So, this is a pretty deep feature. The rabbit hole goes pretty deep here. I, I could do some more examples, but um, uh, I, I, I'll instead I'll switch to some other things. But uh, this is something that we expect to deliver in multiple phases. So, probably in the next version, Java 14, you'll see simple type patterns in instance of, and then maybe the next version, type patterns in switch, and maybe deconstruction patterns will come after that. Uh, a feature that sort of um, uh, sort of appeared, disappeared, and reappeared, which is sort of one of the benefits of the more rapid cadence, is uh, better string literals. One of them, again, one of the most common complaints about Java is multi-line strings, where are they? And it's a trivial feature, but it is, you know, pretty annoying, especially if you're like, you know, you want to cut and paste some SQL or some JSON into some Java code, and you have to mangle it up with more quotes and backslash ends and all of that. And um, manual mangling is annoying, and that's bothersome, but more bothersome is it's error prone, right? And so if you could just cut and paste something in, then that's less error prone, it's more readable. Uh, again, this was something we, we thought about doing for 12, almost finished it, almost proposed it, withdrew it, and then uh, redesigned it, and it will be uh, hopefully a preview feature in 13. So the basic idea here is this is how we do it today. Here's a multi-line chunk of uh, HTML where we have to do explicit uh, new lines and a bunch of concatenations, and instead, uh, by we use this uh, fat triple quote delimiter, you can have a multi-line string, and uh, the dots here are, you're not actually typing the dots, they're, they're, they're meant to illustrate the spaces that the compiler will strip away for you because it knows those really weren't part of your string, those were just an artifact of how you indented your string in your source code, and the spaces that are actually spaces are the ones that stay. Um, and so, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 if, if you refactor your code and indent everything in, it won't actually change the result of, a, of evaluation. So not a particularly deep feature, but something people have asked for and uh, that we thought was worth doing. Okay, so I'm gonna switch topics now. I'm gonna talk about um, a, a much deeper feature, one that I've probably been talking about for almost five years. Some of you may have heard me talk about it before. Some of you might be wondering, Jesus, Brian, you've been talking about this for five years. When are you ever gonna deliver this? Well, this is a big feature. This, is, this one goes pretty deep. Uh, so pr what Project Valhalla is about is about rebooting the way the VM lays out data in memory. 
And this is important because in the last 25, 30 years, hardware has changed a lot. Um, you know, 30 years ago, the relative cost of a memory fetch or an arith arithmetic op were about the same. A few cycles uh, to fetch from memory, a few cycles to do a, a, an addition or multiplication. In the, in the last 30 years, these costs have diverged by, you know, potentially up to a factor of 1,000. If you cache miss all the way out to main memory, you could be looking at 300 cycles before you see that data. And, uh, you know, typical desktop grade, you know, uh, i7 chip can issue four arithmetic operations per cycle. So in the time it takes to cache miss, you've given up 1,000 uh, potential arithmetic slots. Um, and so it stands to reason that if you care about performance, indirections uh, or pointer, pointer fetches are your enemy. And gee, it's kind of unfortunate, but if you look at the way Java lays out data in memory, there's a lot of small islands of data connected by pointers. And you know, this, um, this comes from the everything is an object philosophy from the early 90s. Uh, Java lays out data in this way because of object identity. Um, and identity sometimes serves a value. It's useful for mutability, it's useful for locking, it's useful for uh, uh, polymorphism, but not all objects need all of those things and may not want to pay for all of those things. Um, so uh, the way we end up paying for it is in layout. If we take um, you know, our, a class point how, and we have an array of those points, the way it gets laid out in memory is something like this. We have an array, which is an object with a header, and then its entries are a bunch of pointers, and each pointer points to another object, which also has a header. And so if you look at either the density, memory utilization here, not so good, right? For each two words of data, we have three words of overhead. And if you look at the flatness of memory, it's also not so good. Every time I want to go fetch a new point, I have to traverse a pointer and risk taking a cache miss. Now, the way the language works now, this is the best that the VM can do, uh, but maybe with a little help from, uh, from the user, if we say, look, uh, points is just, uh, it's just a dumb aggregate. It doesn't need its own identity. It's not mutable. It's not polymorphic. It's just, you know, it's just a struct. Um, then the VM can do a little bit better. Um, so, uh, and, and if in, in the absence of being able to do better, Developers tend to do things like this. How many people here have seen people shred, uh, you know, uh, structs into arrays because they think it's faster, right? And this is terrible. We don't want people programming like this. Um, it's harder to read, harder to maintain, and people tend to use these tricks even when they don't have to because programmers have some obsessive compulsive disorder about they read about something as faster 25 years ago and they have to change their code to do it that way or something. Um, so we don't want to be giving programmers this bad choice of abstraction or performance, pick one, because they always pick wrong, right? So if we can give you abstraction and performance, you might actually pick right. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of attempts in the last 15 years for the VM to try to magically figure out whether you're using identity or not, like escape analysis. And that works in the easy cases, but it doesn't really work in the hard cases. Um, and so we need a little help from the programmer. Um, this is the layout that we want to have, where we have an array and the data is laid out x, y, x, y, x, y. So the question is, what code do I need to write to get this layout? And uh, the, um, th what we're calling these is inline classes. Uh, we used to call them value classes. Um, uh, inline means feel free to expand this, uh, you know, this, this structure anywhere it shows up, in arrays, in other objects, in other inline classes, uh, because I promise I don't need an identity here. Uh, and then the compiler will enforce that you can't do the things that our identity would require. Um, and so you can think of these sort of as another one of these trade-offs. I'm giving up identity, what am I getting? I'm getting better density and better flatness. Um, I have to give up the things that identity enables, mutability, uh, extensibility. Sometimes that's a big thing to give up, sometimes it's not. Um, and if it's not, great, I can make that trade and get better behavior, better performance from the runtime. Um, so you could sort of think about um, values as either being sort of uh, faster classes, or you can think of them as being user programmable primitives. Um, you know, 
both views are kind of correct. They can have most of the things classes have. They can have methods, they can have fields, they can implement interfaces, they can use encapsulation, they can have private fields, they can be generic. So there's a lot of things they can have. There's just a few things they can't. Um, and our sort of mantra for how these things work is codes like a class works like an int. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a pretty good one. Um, okay, so who cares? Uh, my claim is everybody cares. Uh, if you're writing uh, applications that use large data sets, you want to be able to cram more data in memory. Better density lets you put more data in memory um, and lets you access, um, and better uh, locality lets you access that data faster. Library writers care a lot. Um, you know, people who write libraries like HashMap can use this to write faster hash maps, and that means everybody's code gets faster. Uh, wrappers like optional can be value types, uh, which means they don't have to be their own heap nodes. They can get inlined um, into the things that refer to them. Compiler writers. Uh, if you're right working on, say, the JRuby compiler, uh, well, Ruby's numerics aren't the same as Java's numerics, and so you end up having to model them with objects, and that means they're slower. Uh, but if you can use inline classes, then you can make them as fast, and all of the, the users of JRuby benefit from that. So, you know, whatever it is you're writing, you're going to benefit from having, um, having value types. Uh, so, like I said, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, we've built actually five separate rounds of prototypes, each aimed at exploring a different aspect of the problem. Um, we're actually at the point where the next prototype is actually going to be usable for people to write data structures and things like that. Should be out sometime this year, probably uh, uh, by late summer. Um, so, you know, we've been chipping away at this problem pretty steadily, and, uh, and, and I think we're getting the upper hand on it. Um, and there's more pieces to come. Uh, you know, the first, uh, the first round of prototypes uh, that are publicly available or publicly use usable uh, won't have all the features, but they'll be usable enough to, to, to try things out. So, okay, let me just give you one performance example, and then I will wrap up. Um, so imagine you're doing a matrix multiplication with complex elements. So you write a complex type with, um, you know, uh, double real, double imaginary components, and you write your add and multiply, um, you know, operations just like it says in the textbook. Uh, pretty straightforward, except for that annoying allocation in the middle of it, which we'd like to get rid of. And then you can write um, matrix multiplication again, transcribing literally out of the textbook, um, where. You know, you, uh, you know, to compute a value, you take the dot product of a row and a column and add those up and, uh, and put that in the, in the new result. This is all, you know, perfectly obvious dumb code. Um, let's take a look at how this performs. So we ran this um, on a sort of laptop grade system, not a big fancy system. Um, and we ran two versions. One is the, um, the, the regular version like I just showed you, and the other is the version where we make complex and inline class. Um, and uh, we compared the performance. So uh, if you look at straight runtime, the, uh, the inline version is about 12 times faster than the, uh, than the boxed version. So that's pretty good. Um, if you look at the amount of allocation it does, you see that the inline version used a factor of about 1,000 less allocation. Than the, um, than the box version, so that's pretty good. Like almost all of those new complex just went away. Uh, the kind of interesting one is uh, this last line, which is uh, instructions per cycle. Um, and it goes back to what I was saying about, um, about how modern hardware can uh, do a lot of work per cycle if you can keep it fed with data. So in the, uh, in the traditional version, we were seeing about one instruction retired per cycle. In the inline version, we're seeing almost three times that because we're spending so much less time waiting for the uh, memory subsystem to cough up data, we can be doing actually a lot more computation. So, uh, you know, th now this is a cherry-picked example where we picked something that was like, uh, uh, sort of embarrassingly parallelizable, um, but uh, you know, th um, data structures can similarly benefit from squeezing indirections and squeezing uh, uh, squeezing heap nodes out as well. So, all right. So to sum up, 
we've got a lot of stuff uh, going on. I've only talked about a couple of the projects. Project Amber has already started uh, delivering features, local variable type inference, expression switch. There's lots more features coming. Um, and some of the longer term projects like Valhalla are also starting to bear fruit. Um, and you know, we should have something that, like I said, is uh, experimental grade probably in the next year or so. I didn't get to talk about Panama and Loom. Panama is about native interop and Loom is about fibers and coroutines. Those are also making big progress. Um, and since we're on a more rapid cadence, if you come back next year, you can um, see what our progress has looked like in the last year. And so thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, a few minutes? Okay. Um, looks like Ben in the back. Uh, yes, but you have a booming voice, you can shout. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, so this is a question I, I, I sort of just inferring from what you were um, talking about when features might be ready. Um, it occurs to me that sort of looking ahead to not 14 but 15, we might have a set of features, um, records, um, sealed types, um, patterns, that, that starts to feel like there was enough there. You know, would, would Oracle consider doing an LTS release maybe a year early for 15? So, um, so that's a good question. So. The, the simple answer is n no, certainly not for that reason. And the reason is um, we deliver features when they're ready. And if people want to use them in the six month releases, they totally can. And if they want to wait for an LTS, they can wait for an LTS. And that choice is, um, is really a choice about your own uh, risk tolerance. Um, so uh, we don't like to think about LTS, non-LTS when we're targeting features. We just target features when they're ready. And if people want to wait for the LTS, then they get to wait. And if they want to use the, the latest stuff when it's ready, great. So we, want, we don't want to introduce couplings that would, uh, that would slow things down, because couplings can only slow things down. More questions? Over there. Hi. Uh we are now having uh, two trends uh, in the Java community, like um, uh, all the features in the language and GraalVM. Uh, GraalVM is, is still using Java 8, and uh, their approach to native compilation is uh, really cool, but uh, for example, Panama and, and other things, how, how they relate. Uh, the, the new features of the language and, and GraalVM? So, um, so, so I think your question is, will GraalVM support all of these features? And the answer is, it had better, because these features are part of the Java platform, and if GraalVM wants to call itself a Java VM, it needs to implement all these features, and so I hope it will. So all right, looks like we're out of time for questions, so thank you very much, everyone.